All right. Well, it's so great to see all of you, all your faces up on my screen. My name is Maggie Williams, and I'm a teacher with Strozzi Institute. I live in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and I actually just flew back yesterday from teaching the Embodied Leadership One in the dojo. So I'm a combination of slightly fuzzy and recovering from travel, uh, and also feeling um, really resourced and really grateful for the four days in the Embodied Leadership One. And got to really see a room full of folks go through that arc of transformation and really see the embodied difference between day one and day four, and also see um, them really naming and moving towards their declarations and what they care about most. So that was a really beautiful experience. How many, if you, can you raise your hand if you've taken the EL1 embodied leadership one? Great, so a lot of, oh, so pretty much everyone on the call. Great, awesome. So you are all very familiar with what I'm talking about and what that journey is like. So that's a little bit about me. I've been with Strozzi um, since about 2011 uh, as a student and now as a teacher. <clears throat> and I actually just completed uh, running a nonprofit organization called the Advocacy Institute, where I, where, which I co-founded and was the co-director of for a number of years. And I just handed that off to another executive director, a new executive director, which is very exciting, mostly so that I can focus on teaching for SI um, more frequently. Um, and also what you can't see by way of the Zoom screen is that I'm about six months pregnant. So I will be, uh, I'm making more space for another child in our family and, and wanted to have more spaciousness for that as well. Um, as I'm like literally losing real estate in my belly every day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's really great to be with you all. Um, thank you for the congratulations. And yes, that's great. So please use the chat while we're on our call this morning. Um, <clears throat> we will have time for discussion. I see that all of you are already on mute. That's great. If you're not on mute, it's helpful just to go on mute so we don't get a lot of background noise. Um, but please do chat comments, questions, thoughts as they come up and we will try to be as responsive as possible. Um, and also just noting that we're recording this call and it will get shared with the broader SI community. So always good for all of us to have that in mind. Hi, Beata, great to hear from you. Glad you're on the call. It's nice to see you. Um, so let's start the way we always start at SI and let's center together. So you can come standing if you like, you can do it sitting. Let's just drop our attention from our thinking self, our computer self into our feeling self. So really dropping our attention below our neck and start by noticing what is. So noticing sensation, temperature, where do you feel cool or warm, pressure, tight or loose, if there's anywhere you feel movement. You can also just go ahead and notice what's your mood and what narratives do you have running this morning? What are you coming in with? And then let's start to center in our four dimensions. So we always center in length, width, depth, and what we care about. So centering in our length, we can drop down to help find our length. So if you're standing, you can really let gravity have your weight. So as if there's a thread gently pulling us up into our natural length, getting more space between our vertebra. Not straining, not reaching, but really relaxing into length. And if we're seated, you can use that seat to help you find your length. So really letting that cushion, that seat, have the weight of your legs. Taking some breaths into length. And as we come into our length, we also center in our dignity. And just acknowledging the dignity of everyone on this call this morning. And then we'll center in our width. 
So let yourself feel for your edges. Might be the outside of your legs, the edges of your arms, sides of your neck and face. You can go ahead and take some breaths into the sides of your rib cage. So really letting your rib cage expand side to side. Seeing if you can really soften into width. Maybe letting your face get wider, your hips and shoulders get wider. can also be a good place, especially as we focus so much on our computer screens, to really let your peripheral vision come into play. And as we center in with, we center in the dimension of connection and community. So really centering in our call this morning with all of us and also centering in the broader SI community that we're a part of. And then we'll center in depth. So taking a moment to feel the back of your body, the back of your legs. If you're seated, maybe the back of your, uh, you can feel your back on the chair. And as we connect with the back side of our body, really connecting with our history and our competence. So it's our come from. All those experiences and people that are at our backs. All the wisdom you bring from your specific expertise onto this call. Any days you've had on the mat at SI. And then moving to the front side of our body is feeling for our legs, front of our legs, soft bellies, soft chest. Centering in what we're moving towards. Centering in what we're inviting more of into our lives. And you can, if it helps, place a hand below your belly button, a couple inches below your belly button. Let yourself really feel your actual center, place of power. And from this place, let yourself really be filled by your commitments. Filled in your length and your width and your depth. Maybe you're really focusing on one commitment right now. Maybe you're holding multiple commitments in multiple domains. And whatever feels most resident, resonant to you, go ahead and speak your commitment to yourself. And then letting the hand go, noticing your mood. And it would be great if a few folks would just chat their mood into the chat so that we can hear your mood or witness your mood is maybe the better way to say it. So we are here to talk about condition tendencies. Great, I'm seeing some of those chats. I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. I'm wondering if everyone can, can mute. Great, I think that took care of it, thank you. So we're here to talk about CT, condition tendencies. Um, I thought I would just start off with a little bit of framing some context. I'm sure this is <clears throat> something you're familiar with, maybe something you work with regularly with your clients if you're a coach, um, <clears throat> and then would open it up for some questions and discussion. 
and then was going to ask you all to get um, going to ask all of you to get into some small group discussions around CT uh, and have some questions for you to take into those small groups. So working to make this format as interactive as possible. So just some framing on condition tendencies. So we really hold that uh, condition tendencies are our automatic response under pressure. And um, they're really what we hold most deeply as our automatic habits and responses. And they include habits, moods, narratives, how we relate to others, actions, non-actions. So I'm sure you all have seen that um, graphic with Strozzi that says the body is the domain of, right? So the body is the domain of moods and actions and habits and narratives. And the CT, this, this response under pressure really impacts us wholly. It impacts all of those domains automatically and very quickly. Um, <clears throat> and it also includes, of course, muscle contraction. So it shows up in our soma and it shows up in, um, <clears throat> in our bodies in many different ways. <clears throat> some internally that we may feel internally and some that are very externally obvious to other people. And the thing that we always want to remember when we're talking with CTs and certainly when we're working with client CTs is that, and I, and I think a lot of other contexts, CTs or whatever they're called in other contexts can often be pathologized. And at Strozzi, we really hold that these were wise, wise adaptations for safety, belonging, and dignity. So at our core as humans, we're really hardwired when we come out as little people to be seeking safety, belonging, and dignity. And these adaptations and these condition tendencies emerge when, for most of us, when we're quite young, at least our deepest held ones often come from when we're quite young. And we really learned them <clears throat> as a way to get some form of either safety or belonging or dignity or perhaps all three. Um, <clears throat> And so when we work with them and when we help other people to work with them, we want to really bring a lot, of, um, a lot of empathy and we want to really make sure to emphasize and work with folks around identifying how has your condition tendency served you. Because we often encounter our condition tendency when we've named our declaration and we're trying to move towards our declaration and we see the condition tendency as the obstacle. Or perhaps the condition tendency is actually even before we knew we wanted help in other ways, the condition tendency might be the thing that we've identified that's getting in our way. It's no longer serving us. It's showing up in contexts where we don't want it to show up. And so we want it gone, right? We want more choice. We're frustrated often by this condition, condition tendency. And it can be very easy for folks to slip into, well, this is this bad part of me. And this is this part that I want to change. And we really want to orient towards the fist in the hand, right? So I'm sure all of you are very familiar. We can, we can even do it now where you make the very tight fist and then you take the other hand and you try to pry that fist open. And this is how a lot of us relate to RCT, right? It's like, stop it. <laughs> I'm sick of this. Why are you doing this again? This is really frustrating. And the fist just gets tighter, just gets tighter and tighter. What we want to do, the orientation, whether it's through somatic body work or through somatic coaching or in our own work with ourselves, is really to take this other hand and fill it with a lot of love and empathy and gently cradle that fist. And it's as if we're sort of giving that fist a supportive hug. It's like we're not quite squeezing, but we're supporting the contraction, quite literally. And if you do that, you can start to really feel that fist open. And I just find this to be a really powerful metaphor um, and something that I like to come back to a lot for myself is when I'm getting frustrated with my, myself, it's like, where's that hand around my fist? And when I'm working with clients, where's their hand around their fist? So that we can really have this felt sense of how did this serve us? And let's get really concrete about that. Let's have a conversation about um, the way this condition tendency has shown up and really served you and let's bow into that. It can also be really helpful to help folks identify what are some of the origins. There can often be some really powerful stories um, <clears throat> where, you know, a family member really took away someone's dignity 
either intentionally or not intentionally. Um, so, you know, I have a two year old, a daughter who's about to turn two on Saturday. And a question that I'm often in is what unintended messages might I be sending her around safety, belonging and dignity. And, you know, does she ever feel like her connection to me is conditional? And how do I make it clear that it's not, right? And so these are things that we learned very early on. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't mean that the people who created the environment are necessarily at fault. Sometimes there is fault, but oftentimes there were, there were, oftentimes there were best, in, best of intentions that had unintended impacts, right? And of course, all those people that we were interacting with as small people had their own condition tendencies and their own shaping that they were also struggling with. Um, so then we also want to move into really identifying the cost because there is significant cost and that's why we want to shift our own CTs. That's why clients are coming into our doors. That's why they want support is that there's a cost and it's decreasing our choice. Um, we can't think our way out of these condition tendencies and often one of the sort of significant costs that we see across the board is a loss of connection. Usually our CTs in some way are contributing to us not connecting in the ways we most want to with other people. There may be other costs as well, but that can be a really good place to start to look and is like quality of connection in our lives and in the lives of the people we serve. I often think of the condition tendency as this overused muscle. So it's this muscle that we've just been using and using and using since we were really little. And sometimes I had this experience myself where when I first started working at SI, I was kind of afraid of losing my CT. I, I felt like sometimes I like this. <laughs> sometimes I wanna be able to call on this. Uh, I don't wanna lose this forever. And I think what we can really emphasize with people is that this is deeply held and it will always be there when you need it. You're never gonna to get to the point where you are completely rid of, CT, of your CT and where you've eradicated it from your soma. That's not our goal and it will never happen. The reality is, is that it will always be there if you need it, but what we're trying to actually do is build up some of these underdeveloped muscles that are gonna help us have more choice and more connection. So it's really about building in that choice that if I can feel my CT coming sooner, if I can identify it somatically before I've moved in that automatic direction, then it becomes less automatic. I've identified it sooner, I can feel when it's coming, and I can make a different choice. And I can make a choice that most importantly is aligned with my declaration or in line with my values and my vision. So I'm just gonna actually pull up for a second <clears throat> the arc of transformation, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Bear with me. I wanna share my screen with you, but I don't wanna share my very messy desktop with you. <laughs> Uh, so if you've been through an EL1 or really any other course at SI, you have, are familiar with this graphic. And here we are in the arc of transformation. And really, oops, can you all see my screen now? Great. So here we are in our current shape. And of course, I just wanna to name to some extent this arc is linear and even in an EL1, we can kind of track how we're moving folks through where, we, you know, day one and day, day one and a half, day, day one and day two, we're really focusing on just feeling the body, increasing somatic awareness and identifying commitment, right? And in, we have to have that commitment. We need folks to know what they care about and what they're moving towards before we dive into deep work around the condition tendency. That's really critical because we wouldn't risk change. We wouldn't risk this thing that has losing or transforming, I should say, not losing, transforming this thing that has served us if we don't have a forsake of what on the other side of it. And we don't have a clear idea of what we're moving towards. And then of course, the somatic openings and the connection and the embodied practices are how we actually move towards new shape. So in some ways, this is somewhat linear and we are moving people through this arc. And of course, folks are gonna jump around and move around and we're gonna be, in the, we're gonna be working on connection and we're gonna realize we wanna revise our commitment. 
we're going to be working on new embodied practices and we're still going to be having somatic opening. So it's not as if we just complete each circle fully before we move to the next. And there is a way, certainly in a course or working with a coaching client, where you can really see this movement from current shape to new shape and this movement through the arc. So I just want to really ground that a lot of the work around CT happens <clears throat> specifically after there's a, enough somatic awareness to notice how the CT is showing up. So all of you have done the grab practice where someone comes in and grabs your arm. It's critical that folks can at least feel some sensation in their bodies to, and then the grab helps elicit them feeling more, right? Um, and then also that they know what they're moving towards. They have some sense. It may not be the most perfectly worded declaration. That's not what's important, but they have a sense of the vision that they want to be moving towards. Any questions about the arc of transformation while we're here? If you're on mute, you can just unmute if you want to ask a question. Maggie, this is uh, Bao. And by the way, I'm also in, uh, in Brooklyn. Hi, um, Bao. So I'm personally, I have what I've experienced is indeed that my, um, my old shape, if you like, um, um, has never gone really away. Um, and the, the, the current, the condition tendencies that I've had have served me in so many good ways. Mm -hmm. But what I, instead of saying new shape, I feel it's much more integrated. And so I have more repertoire that I've been able to build. And mm -hmm. what do you think about the word integration uh, as opposed to new, which sounds a little bit like there is a discontinuity, as it were. How do you feel about that? And with integration, I mean the linking of differentiated parts, the, the more connecting and, mm -hmm. and creating a new whole, as it were. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think using whatever is going to work for you and your journey makes sense. And certainly, I think integration makes a lot of sense conceptually as we integrate having more choice, as we integrate um, uh, moving away from this automatic response and, and being able to draw on a, a wider tool set. Absolutely. It's like you're integrating those new choices, those new options. I think what's important about the concept of new shape and what's different about the Strozzi lineage or a somatic lineage is that we're really working with the soma. And quite literally, when I looked at this room of EL1 participants on day one and EL1 participants on day four, they looked like different people. Their dignity was, they were embodying their dignity, their shoulders, their center was over their hips in a really different way. I mean, if you think about that practice of mutual connection, um, you know, the first couple days of an EL1, folks are extend, like harshly extending their arm, they're leaning way forward, they're leaning way back. All those CTs are showing up in their ability to do mutual connection. And the way they were able to connect with each other and feel themselves and feel the other person was somatically transformed. It was literally a new shape in the room. And so I think that's where that concept is important. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Thanks. And also noting for folks that there's a lot of deepening around the work with condition tendencies in the embodied leadership too. So if that's a course, maybe some of you have already taken it, um, but it's a great way to dig into more of our own work around condition tendency, which then, of course, makes us better equipped to work with clients, right? Because the more work we do um, and the more we walk the path, then the easier it is for us to, to help others. Uh, any other questions around the arc? Okay, I'm going to stop my share so I can see more of your faces again. Great. See another chat. What's the top one in orange? I couldn't see the name of it. That's somatic opening. So that's somatic opening. And again, with somatic opening, we're going to see that in a wide range. So we want to be very, very careful with, with clients when we're working with them, um, kind of bias or create this sense that somatic openings only happen in one way. We can have somatic openings when we're centering. We can have somatic openings when we're in mutual connection. We can have somatic openings when we're doing spirited commitment to dignity and having a big, big, big opening, right? Somatic openings can be crying and tearful. They can be joyful. They can be um, a release of sensation that's very internal and maybe not as externally obvious. So just want to also keep a, a wide range when we think about somatic opening. Um, 
And then just to say about CT, so the main ways that we see them showing up are, and these are sort of broad categories, is a move towards. So this might look like a lack of boundaries, overly appeasing. Um, <clears throat> we also see a move away. So this is really a, a holding back and a move against, which is more of a fight. Uh, so Richard likes to tell this story that is um, a sort of innocuous framing around these, these terms. He's, you know, if, you, if I invite you to come to a book opening with me and you don't know anyone else there, <clears throat> and then I don't show up, how, what's your inclination for how you respond? So are you the person who gets the drink and stands in the corner and doesn't really want to interact with anyone? Um, that's a move away. Are you the person who wants to go in quickly with as many people as you possibly can and get as many business cards as you possibly can, then you're a move towards? Or are you the person that's gonna go up to the author and offer them a, an unsolicited critique of their book, right? So a move, a move against. So that's just a very, um, I would say kind of low, there's not a lot of high, there are not a lot of high, high cost triggers in that scenario, but it can just be helpful to think about, oh, like how would I, how would I place myself there? Uh, a move towards, a move away, a move against. <clears throat> Any questions about CTs in general? Actually, I have a question about that example. Mm -hmm. um, because when I think through that example, it's very different than what I consider my CT. And I'm curious, like in that example, as an extrovert, I see that as a non-threatening um, environment. So I think I would be much more moved towards, whereas if I were to see it as a threatening environment, I think I would pull away. And just curious about that, because that just stopped me because my, or at least what I think my response to that scenario is different than what I think my CT is. That's great. Yeah, I think mostly what that example is trying to get at is illuminating for folks that are less familiar what we, what we might even mean by move away, move towards, move against. I completely agree with you. I think there are definitely ways in which as an extrovert, you might be very happy to be socializing and it has nothing to do with your CT. Um, and that when you're actually under pressure, experiencing that literal grab of your wrist in a, in a practice or experiencing more significant pressure that you'll experience a very different reaction. Um, I also think it's important to note that we don't just have one CT we usually have one that we major in that's kind of big time and shows up in a lot of different settings. But then we also have ones that we minor in and that come up at different points in our lives. And maybe there's some that we've developed uh, later in life uh, for, for very good reasons, right? So we don't have to look for just the one right answer, of course. There might be an, an, a range of ways in which we respond depending on the depth of the, of the pressure and the context of the pressure. There's a question, can you say the context of the moves toward away against? I'm not understanding the question. So Miriam, if you want to clarify that, I'm happy to try and answer it. I can share personally that when I first came to SI, part of what really brought me in the door was I didn't know that I wanted a commitment or a declaration. I don't think I even knew that was a part of the framework until I got into the EL1. Um, but I did know that I was in my early 30s and I was in a number of prof professional environments where I was feeling this very strong fight and where I was getting into a lot of conflict with supervisors and with colleagues and ending up in a lot of situations where I felt was feeling very self-righteous. Um, like I had a lot of contributions to offer and people weren't wanting to hear them. And, um, and there was a lot of tension and a lot of conflict. And I was seeing how this was playing out and I was starting to see the costs. And I was starting to see that this was not gonna lead me down the professional path that I wanted to be going down. And the way that it was showing up in my body was a really puffed out chest of course, I didn't necessarily have all the language for this before I went through Astrosi, um, but it was a really puffed out chest, a lot of narrowing of my width. So it was almost just like my vision would get narrow, my face would get narrow and tight. When I think of it now, when I feel it now, it's like if there are people on either side of me, they just kind of energetically disappear. Everything comes in really narrow. My chest gets really puffed out and there's a lot of heat rising up through my belly and into my chest. 
Um, and getting to really work with that CT very early on, once I had actually formed a declaration and I knew what I was moving towards, was incredibly powerful. Um, and I got to really feel that fight. Now, I also still have an away. So just this past week when I was practicing the grad practice, one of my colleagues um, uh, on the team, he was like, it feel, he's like, are you, are you still in the room with us? Because it feels like you've gone off to the hills. <laughs> And I was like, you know, you're right. I haven't even felt the grab yet, but I'm actually staring out the window and taking myself away before the grab even comes in. Like I'm engaging in some self-care CT before I'm even feeling the person grabbing my arm. And it was incredibly insightful because of course, before you model that in front of a room of people, you don't want to actually have already disappeared. So just noting that there are a number of different ways that we might feel these things show up for us and using different practices can be a really helpful way to elicit those responses. So I want to get you all into some conversation with each other before that. Any, any more questions for us as a group and then we can also talk a little bit after your small group conversations. Am I willing to share where one of those CTs came from? Great question. Uh, I am. <clears throat> so the fight uh, I think really came from, from my father and I say that with a lot of respect for him. Uh, he had a very strong fight and he could get very puffed up and quite assertive very, very quickly. And I think that I learned early on that to be heard and to um, get my voice heard, to get in the mix, to get my way, that that was the way you did it, that you became a little bit of a bully to get your way and get things done. And um, part of why I was motivated to work on it at a relatively young age is because I saw how that played out in his life, both, both personally and professionally. And I saw that he did not have the connections that he wanted professionally or personally. Um, and I saw the very, very high cost that it came with. And I, I didn't want that for myself. So thank you for asking. I think that was Jenny. So have we ever tried doing the grab virtually? Um, we can't, I mean, yes, that is possible to do. Mostly what you do if you're trying to do the grab virtually is you can have people like walk up really close to their computer screens. So it's like their faces are uncomfortably close on their computer screens. It is also a practice that you could teach someone and have them do at home with someone in their life, as long as you don't think it's going to elicit a deep, deep trauma response, right? So, um, and there are some other ways, I think, remotely to try to elicit the grab. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm like reading chats and trying to talk to you at the same time. <laughs> uh, so let's get you all into some small groups where you can talk a little bit more about what's coming up for you. So what I'm going to ask for you to do actually in this moment is just take a moment to recenter because we're not going to do a grab practice. So just take a moment to recenter. And if we were in person, we would, we would definitely be doing the grab practice right now. Dropping your breath, find your length width and depth. Try to remember the last time that you felt pressure. So this could be significant personal dynamics. This could be opening your inbox on Monday morning and just feeling really overwhelmed by everything that's in it. So you can really pick what's gonna help. Connect with what came up in your body in that moment, if it's possible for you. So what sensations emerged? What sensations emerged? And what we're gonna ask you to do, so sort of file that away, make note of what you're noticing. And in your breakout groups, you're gonna have a brief conversation and I'll put these in the chat so you have them with you. Do you have a sense of what CT you major in towards away against? Where is one place that that CT lives in your body? And how has it served you and how does it limit you? You might get to some or not all of those questions. I'll be sure to put them in the chat. 
just a note on Zoom protocol. So in a moment, you'll get a request to come into a breakout room. You need to select yes. And then when you're in the breakout room, you'll get a request to rejoin our main room at the end of the 10 minutes. So just make sure you select yes, I wanna rejoin the main conversation. And you'll get a one minute warning in your small group. So just make sure that everyone gets a chance to share something, if not an answer to all the questions. So I'll put the questions in the chat and we'll put you into these small group conversations. And thanks for the great questions so far. I'm gonna chat them right now. Hey folks, welcome back. Um, hopefully you got to have some fruitful conversations. One thing I wanted to mention that came up in the small group that I was in that feels really worth mentioning to all of you and uh, is that oftentimes our CTs are our way of internalizing boundaries when we're young and we don't have all the tools we need to externalize our boundaries. This is why there's often a loss of connection because we're literally trying to protect ourselves in some way, whether that's a fight or whether that's a, I'm gonna move away because there's this person who's kind of suffocating in my life. Whatever it is, um, a lot of times it's an internalization of a boundary. And so we wanna develop our tools and the tools of our clients to be able to set those boundaries externally. And some of this came up in EL1, right, where you're working on declines and requests. And just want to say that, again, this is something that happens in an, on an even deeper level in EL2, where you're really working more declines, more requests, more accepts, um, learning some different types of declines. Uh, and so just deepening our work around how do we set boundaries externally in ways that are aligned with our values. At Strozzi, we often say it's hard to have an authentic yes if we don't have an authentic no, right? And that's a lot of how we can then relax and not feel like we have to hold our CT as tightly because we were actually creating safety in other ways. So um, one question that I have for you, if anyone is willing to share is, um, <clears throat> What, what would help you blend more with your CT? What would help you bring a little more of that loving hand to support your CT? Is there anyone who's willing to share? We can share. Great. Um, Hi, everybody. I, I think one thing that I recognized while we were in small group is just my need for time. Mm -hmm. When I have my move away, I'm really looking for time to process, time to know what I need to do to react, time to just experience what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And so if I can recognize that, I think there's a more centered part of me that can set boundaries to create time, whether that's a a maybe or a no for now or a conditional yes. Um, I think there's a different part of me that can kick in and navigate that conversation to buy myself the time that I need in order to, um, to really honor that first reaction of the freeze and the, the move away. That's beautiful and such great noticing. And um, sometimes we really just need to make requests for more time. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm happy. Uh, yeah. You want another example or? Uh, let me just hold and see if anyone else wants to jump in who hasn't shared yet. Is there anyone else who wants to add? Great, yes, I see your hand. Wendy, right? Yeah. Yep. Hi. Um, I would say that <clears throat> the practice of self-compassion while you're doing mm -hmm. it and realizing that it's a journey as much as um, it's a destination, you know, it's never going to end the practice of it. Right. So it's like right. each time and, um, that you have a point of practice is that opportunity to deepen the practice. So awesome. that's, that's what I remind myself of. Yeah, that's great. And good for all of us to remember. We are often our own greatest critics. So Linus, I realize I, um, I should have had you introduce yourself at the beginning. I apologize that I didn't do that, but would you just present yourself and, um, I think you wanted to share a little bit about some of the upcoming courses. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Maggie. Um, I think I know most of you on this call if <laughs> like we've had conversations um, about other courses, but I'm Salunas Nicole Adams and I'm the Director of Enrollment. Um, I'm, Maggie did a really great job talking about CTs and leading us through some practices. Um, I would like to just share that our Embodied Leadership Level 2 is a really great course to go deeper to do that work for self. Um, inside that you will, inside that course, you will um, do an emotional autobiography. You'll start to really uncover where these tendencies came from, how you got shaped this way, what they were trying to take care of, and then step into more choice and options, right? Start to develop those new shapes, new practices. So it's a really great course for that. Um, that course will be coming up July 9th through, sorry, I want to say the 12th, July 9th through the 12th. Um, the other course that um, was lightly referenced here was body work, right? We talked a lot about shape and how we're holding ourselves. And I would just um, recommend if you've not done body work, even if you have, it is probably my favorite course. It is inside the methodology. It will give you so much insight around what's happening, happening around um, bands of armor, how the body is shaped, and really give you some connect. Um, some direct contact with that. And that course is coming up in June, June 24th through the 28th. If you have any questions, you want to chat a little bit more about where you are, I'm available. You can just go to the website and set an appointment with me and I'm happy to just go deeper with you. Thanks. I'm muted, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to also say the body work course is, is incredible. I will give a second shout out for that. Um, so we're nearing completion. It has been lovely to practice with all of you this morning and to see all of your faces and just to be reminded of the broad reach that SI has out in the world and all the folks that are out there that are a part of this lineage. We had a, a person in this EL1 who asked, how many Strozzi people are there out in the world this, at this course? And we were like, well, we're doing a survey right now to try to figure that out. Um, so hopefully if you all get that, you will, you will be responsive. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully on another one of these, on another one of these calls. If you just wanna go ahead and share your closing mood check, that would be much appreciated. Um, and we can all sign off and hopefully recenter, maybe even go do a two step before you transition to your next project, phone call, email, whatever it is, and take this, this conversation with you. It's been great to be with you all this morning. Thank you so much.